Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. Tonight we're going to take a look at the bright object in the southwest sky. And we're going to see what it really is. Now, a little while ago I put out a video showing how we could determine that. using astrometry. And this video has become quite popular uh, unexpectedly to me. I didn't realize how viral this was going to go. We, I've had almost 9,000 hits on it, uh, which for my channel is quite large. And those hits have been increasing in just the last week or so, uh, even though this, this video is almost a month old. And most of the feedback's been positive, but some of it's been quite negative from people who still don't believe that this is really just Venus which is what it turned out to be. So one comment uh, that I received from somebody who's probably not familiar with this channel <laughs> wanted to see a telescopic view and this person seemed to think I didn't have a telescope. Well, surprised, I do. So we're gonna take a look through the telescope tonight and verify that this is really just the planet Venus. So right now, the cameras uh, and the telescope is actually looking at Mars. And I'm going to try to switch this to the built-in webcam. Here we go. You can see I still got the Christmas tree in the background. Merry Christmas, everybody. And these are the coordinates that the telescope is currently pointed at right from the hand controller. So that's Mars. Those are the coordinates for Mars at the equinox of date right now. Now, a while ago, I came up with a spreadsheet for calculating the position of Venus using equations that go back to Simon Newcomb in the late 19th century. And so I'm going to share that here. So here's the spreadsheet. Hope you guys can see this. Yep. So today's date, and let's see, right now we are 50 minutes past the hour, right on time. And the approximate location in Florida. We scroll down here, we have the coordinates for Venus. And what we are interested in for the telescope is inputting the coordinates at the equinox of date. These are the coordinates that the telescope expects. The LX200 Classic will precess the coordinates of the planets automatically at startup, but after that point, it expects any tels any coordinates that you feed it manually to be processed for it to the equinox of date. And that's what you see in the left side here. On the right side, we have J2000 coordinates, which are at the reference epoch of the year 2000. But we want to give it these coordinates here that are processed to tonight. And that's what the spreadsheet calculates for you on the left side. So that's exactly what I'm going to put in, 21, 44, 5, and then in declination, negative 15 degrees, 24, 38. So this is uh, hours, minutes, seconds in right ascension, and degrees, minutes, seconds in de declination. And that's exactly the numbers I'm going to put into the hand controller now and show you guys. So I'm going to stop the screen sharing on that. Let's get back to the webcam here. So now I'm going to put in on the hand controller 21. 4405 negative 15 degrees 2438 so you guys can see that right ascension at the top ra declination at the bottom dec now i'm going to hit go to oh sorry Got to hit enter when entering manual coordinates. You have to enter the final line and then it'll automatically go to. Hear that? That's the telescope. Now let's see what the telescope sees at those coordinates. We have Venus. And oh, what's this? A second object next to Venus? Now this has been reported in some videos. But notice here, as I move Venus up and down with the hand controller, this second object just to the 
left of Venus in your view, that is moving opposite the way Venus is moving. This is a lens flare due to the focal reducer, which I have on the telescope right now. I'm going to center it up there, and we're going to reduce the exposure. Now, sometimes you'll get a filter flare. That's a different kind of lens flare. It's a reflection within a glass filter that's outside of the optical train, so in front of the lens, usually. Filter flare, it will not move opposite the way that the object is. A filter flare will move the way that the object is moving, giving it the illusion of being a real object. In this case, this is an internal reflection. It's inside, it's behind the, the mirror in the optical train. It's right in front of the camera, between the camera and the telescope's main primary mirror. And so this is an internal reflection which acts like a normal lens flare. But if you had a piece of glass sitting out in front of the telescope capable of producing a filter flare, uh, you would get an object that appears to move with the main object, a reflection of Venus that appears to move with Venus as you dance the camera around. Uh, that's not the case here, but it can happen. So now I'm going to reduce the exposure, and we're going to take a look at Venus. There we go. Notice I am at notice I am at one three thousandth of a second exposure here. With the focal reducer, Venus is incredibly bright, and you have to set the exposure very fast. I turned off AGC, that's automatic gain control, that makes the image bright. And even then I had to reduce the exposure to one three thousandth of a second. Yes, Venus is incredibly bright, that's to be expected. It's the brightest object in the sky next to the sun and moon. So it's even brighter than the brightest star, Sirius, by quite a lot. Now, as Venus, as you can see, it's currently about half phase or um, half full. As it recedes in phase and gets closer to Earth, it becomes a crescent, but it actually becomes brighter due to the fact that it's getting closer to Earth. So even though the phase is decreasing, the apparent magnitude is getting brighter each night because it's getting closer to Earth. Now, at some point, at some point, the phase angle function, the fact that it's becoming a thinner and thinner crescent, will take over and dominate the magnitude. And basically, even though it's continuing to get a little closer to Earth, that will no longer out, outweigh the fact that the phase is decreasing, decreasing. And so then the magnitude will start to decrease. But counterintuitively, that point comes when it's already reached a crescent phase. Now, I'm going to increase... I'm going to take off the focal reducer and increase the magnification. We'll, we'll take a, a close-up look here at Venus. Now, Mars, which we saw at the start of the webcast, uh, Mars is above Venus and further to the south a little bit, higher in the sky, as a relatively bright red star, but it's nowhere near as bright as Venus. It's very obvious there in the southwest.
now I must refocus the telescope. So what you're seeing now is the heavily defocused image of Venus because I took off the focal reducer. That dramatically changes the focus point. So now I must refocus it. And it's really a huge donut shape, which we're only seeing a piece of here at this magnification. This, this shape is due to the, uh, the mirror of the telescope. Much better. So there we go. Now, unfortunately, Venus does set quite early from this location over the roof line. So due to the high roof line, I'll only be able to continue webcasting Venus here for about 20 minutes. So this will be a fairly short webcast, but I just wanted you guys to be able to see that this was indeed Venus. And you can see it looks like it's about half full right now. And as I said, it'll continue to get brighter even as it becomes a crescent phase because it's also getting closer to Earth as it becomes a crescent. So I know we have probably a lot of new viewers to the channel. I've been looking at the statistics for uh, where some of these views are coming from. Uh, that previous video I did about Venus had way more than I was expecting. And uh, there's more views there, there than I even have subscribers. You know, look at the views. Most of them, the vast, vast majority, seem to be coming from people clicking on the video from their home page, not necessarily because they are, you know, they are a subscriber. So please subscribe to my channel if uh, you'd like to learn more about planets like Venus and 
do astronomy. But for those who have been on the channel a while and are quite familiar with Venus and the fact that this bright object is Venus, please be nice to those who might be new to astronomy, might be new to this, and maybe coming from channels that have been misleading people because there are a number of channels on YouTube that have been misleading people about this object. So let's be patient with them and uh, be cordial because I've been seeing a lot of a lot of animosity on both sides of the aisle here, as it were. And I really want the channel to be uh, civil. So let's everybody try to have this discourse in a civil fashion. But I do want to answer any questions if anyone has any questions. So I'm just loading up the chat now. So if anybody's got any questions about this, uh, ah, Sean asks, uh, Sean Hufford asks, is it upside down due to the reflector in the scope or is it the camera mounted upside down? Actually, right now, uh, this is actually true orientation and it should be true orientation because I've got the camera set to internally uh, flip the view 180 degrees. It would normally be uh, upside down, I believe, but I think, yeah, I'm looking at it in my head and trying to work out the geometry here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've got it set to the right orientation right now. There is a way in this particular camera to internally uh, flip and rotate the view in 90 degree in increments, at least. So if I if I have it upside down right now. Oh, you know what? You're right. I'm sorry, guys. I totally I keep forgetting this. Yes. Um I I do have it set wrong because to my view, it looks normal, but Google Google Hangouts mirrors my view left to right. I always forget this. It's it's so tough to remember. <laughs> when you're when you're looking through the telescope, there's no point of reference to tell you, hey, dummy, it's it's mirrored. Um the view I have is actually correct. The view you have is flipped the wrong way around. Let me flip it back the right way around. Give me a second here. There. That ought to be correct. Sean Hufford, does that look right to you? Because I th think that should look right. Okay, great. It's correct now. So, yes, I'm in there. <laughs> the only reminder I have that the view is mirrored is, is the fact that when I go into the camera menu, the words are all backwards. But even then, it, it doesn't always strike me that when I'm looking at Venus or whatever, the moon, uh, when it looks normal to me, it's actually mirrored for everybody else. So uh, we have about... Ooh, probably about 13 minutes here till it starts to hit the roof line. But anyone have any more questions? I'm, we're burning the clock faster than expected here. Time's flying when you're having fun.
And I should also mention for anyone checking the orientation here, first of all, this is somewhat approximate because the camera and, and really the, the whole star diagonal can rotate 360 degrees around on the telescope freely. There's no locks it into position so that the camera's correctly orthogonal to the telescope. You can rotate this thing all you want physically. And so it's difficult to get it perfectly aligned. Also, keep in mind the view here is from a polar aligned perspective, not out as aligned. So there, there's no field rotation at play here. This is an equatorial view. Uh, so it should be orthogonal to the equatorial grid, but that's only approximately. And I'll, I'll demonstrate here for a second. There's a trick you can do. This is a this is a quick amateur astronomer pro tip here, real quick. So I've got the telescope polar lined. I've got a drive system that can move in both right ascension and declination. So if I want to know how on my camera alignment is. I can just move it left and right and see how it doesn't quite move perfectly level. It's kind of got an angle to its motion there. That indicates the camera's not perfectly orthogonal to the telescope. It's, it's slightly rotated. Like I said, this is only approximate uh, because I, you know, manually by hand just eyeballing where the camera should be uh, to be square on with the telescope, and it's not perfect. But you can tell it's not perfect by moving the telescope left and right. So if you drew a line, an imaginary line, based on the motion you're seeing here of me moving Venus left and right, be parallel to the equatorial grid. And so if you rotated the entire image by that amount, you would be right on. So, uh, David Eubanks, uh, Eubanks says, uh, wow, for half it's bright. And indeed, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it will reach its brightest point, actually, when it's a crescent phase. And already, as we're getting lower and closer to the uh, roof line, you can see it looks probably more turbulent now than it did at the start of the webcast. As we're getting closer to that roof line, the heat waves coming off the roof are going to make the view deteriorate, unfortunately. So I'm going to try to see if I can pull up here and the Dan Juan formula Venus, which was published in the year 1949. 
and it's based on data that he collected on the brightness of Venus over the previous 10 years or so. And even though it predates modern photometry methods, it's still good enough for comparison to, say, visual observations. And I, I did do some measurement of that, uh, of the brightness of Venus, a couple years ago. Basic photometry uh, with some of the eye telescope equipment, and it matched up perfectly in one formula. But it's interesting that in looking at that formula, you can tell all the, um, the brightness of Venus is determined by the phase angle, but also the, the distance. And those are competing factors when it's getting brighter like this. loading right now. dear. Oh, come on. Don't do this to me. <laughs> Sorry, this computer is very slow. This is my sacrificial astronomy laptop. It's cheap for a reason. Now it's collecting dew and it's getting wet. And I don't want to put a good laptop in a condition like this.
So it's going to load. All right, this is good enough. I hate photo bucket. I officially hate photo bucket. What they did to photo bucket is a shame. Okay. Fortunately, I've got the screenshot here of, of this equation sitting on photo bucket at the moment, but it'll do. So, man, about a horde of mosquitoes in front of me too. Uh, it's unseasonably warm here in Florida this Christmas. Uh, so we have the magnitudes of the planets. This is uh, this is from a quite old book that publishes the Dan Juan formula, and this shows in here on this page the general formula to determine the magnitude of the planet. Now, v one comma zero. This is a standardized magnitude for each planet. This is specific to each planet. You can see here it says v equals v in parentheses one comma zero. That is uh, specific to the particular planet you're looking at, and that is again empirically determined. Dan Juan uh, empirically determined this uh, in the early part of the 20th century, along with delta m a, which is the phase angle function. So as the phase gets smaller, it uh, adds a larger number onto this equation. Because remember, apparent magnitude in, in astronomy is a little bit counterintuitive in that uh, as the numbers get smaller and in Venus's case more negative, uh, the planet's actually getting brighter. So uh, we also have this 5 times the log of r times d. Now this is distance from the Earth and from the Sun. So as that distance decreases, it's adding on to this equation a smaller number. The smaller the number, meanwhile the phase angle, as the phase angle is decreasing, the delta ma, uh, which is a separate e equation, again, empirically determined uh, for Venus and, and specific to Venus in, in that case, that is getting larger as the phase angle is getting smaller, proportional uh, to the phase angle. And so as that phase angle decreases, the planet is getting dimmer, but the planet in this case is also getting closer. And for a while, this part of the equation, 5 times the log of r times d, actually exerts a greater effect on the overall magnitude of the planet than the phase angle function. And as the phase angle decreases more and more, eventually that starts to exert a larger effect and the magnitude of the planet will start to uh, get dimmer as it approaches uh, it's sun in the sky, but until that point is reached, even as it becomes a crescent phase, it's still going to continue to get brighter. And this equation uh, still works to this day, so we know Venus is as bright as it should be. And I can do a separate video about that later, if you guys want to see how that equation still works even today. But for the moment, let's go back to our view of Venus as it starts to set on the roof line. Now, let's see. I'm going to deliberately defocus Venus uh, because we should be able to see the roof line as it starts to appear in front of the telescope's mirror. The telescope has an 8-inch mirror. This is an 8-inch LX200 Classic. The large, the lower part of the mirror will start to be obscured by the roof line before the upper part of the mirror. And you can actually see that's happened here. Remember before, it was a full donut shape uh, due to the shape of the mirror. Now the mirror is half obscured by the line of the roof. And you can see it takes on sort of a, 
uh, crescent shape. So basically at this point, this means that Venus is already half set over the roof. Half of the mirror is obscured from seeing Venus and the upper half of the mirror can still see it. But it's interesting, isn't it, how even with half the mirror obscured, once Venus is in focus, you can hardly tell that anything has changed. Yeah, Sean, we can we can pan back to Mars briefly um, after Venus is set. Um, I'm not going to stay on it for too long, though. I, I'd only plan to webcast for about as long as Venus was going to be uh, visible tonight. Uh, CB asks if I'm going to be doing any filming of Comet Honda, and I, I am. I'm, I do plan to do that in the coming year. Um, I think it gets good around, really good around February or so, 
well placed for viewing. Right now, it's not particularly well placed for viewing. It's even lower on the horizon than uh, Venus. So, uh, not the best at the moment, but I will be viewing it later. Uh, let's see. Saw another question here. Uh, what my what is my favorite planet? My, <laughs> my favorite planet for viewing would probably be Saturn. Fantastic. So TJL says this this is a horrible image that he has 5x night vision and he could get a better shot. Well, maybe he could at the moment since uh, most of Venus is obscured by now by the roof line. So we had a much better shot of it just earlier in the webcast. If you re rewind a little bit, you'll see. I have a really good viewing of Venus tonight, actually. But at this point, you can start to see that the image of Venus is badly distorted, uh, even when it's in focus now. So if I deliberately unfocus Venus for a moment, it should look like a donut shape normally. But right now it looks like a line because that's all that's left of the mirror that hasn't yet been obscured by the roof line. And what little is left is suffering under severe uh, atmospheric turbulence from heat waves that are leaving the roof. All right, so for the last request, I'll throw it back on um, Mars here in a second. Yeah, things may have gotten a little bumped around here since I took the focal reducer off earlier. Let me fix that. So that's, that's about in focus there. Let's 
we can just just barely detect a little bit of surface features there. It's very small, isn't it? But it's there. All right, and one last thing. I'm going to digitally zoom in on it uh, just so we can see it up close. There we go. Not the best way to do things. I really should put a Barlow on it instead of a digital zoom, but uh, just to finish off, I just wanted to see if we could tease out uh, those surface details at all. Mars is uh, quite far from Earth right now, though, and not well placed for viewing. Current distance is uh, 1.6 uh, uh, astronomical units. I'd have to run in and get my phone to find out uh, what the... Let me see if I can just Google it here. Curious how many arc seconds it is right now. Can't be many. Uh, let me run in and get my phone. This guy's fire will tell me real quick. Be right back. just upgraded to Sky Safari 5 Pro, and I can't recommend this program anymore because it is fantastic. I, I couldn't give a stronger recommendation. It's as uh, capable as most desktop planetarium programs, but fits in your phone. Parent size, 5.8 arc seconds. That is really not much. That's only about 10 times the theoretical limit of resolution of this telescope. So if you want to think about it in terms of trying to sample it, and really it doesn't hurt to oversample a little bit, but that's, that's a whole another discussion. If you sampled the image so that one pixel corresponded to the limit of resolution of the telescope, uh, it would only be about 10 pixels across anyway. So yeah, it's far away and it's tiny. And let's give that some perspective with the Venus right now. 
So Venus, uh, for comparison, was 20.9 arc seconds across, which is still a very, very small angle, but to a telescope like this, it's a lot more to work with uh, than we have with Mars right now. 20.8 arc seconds. So 2020 vision the ability is the ability to resolve objects that are one arc minute apart from each other or about 60 arc seconds. So Venus is about three times smaller than anything you can resolve with the human eye right now. All right, and that's it for this webcast. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Clear skies, folks.